I want to speak this um, evening under the subject for such a time as this, for such a time as this. And even that story, as you know, that I'm about to read in Esther chapter 4 and verse 1 is the story of a dark, dark, dark moment in the history of Israel. And again, God gloriously delivers because whenever the enemy comes in like a flood, God, by his spirit, raises a standard against him. So I want to speak to someone here who uh, may be feeling, Pastor, I've tried, I tried this, I tried that, I've been pushing for something. And I want you to, to lift your expectation afresh. Because the times have changed, the season has altered, and we may find that there's a different script for this time, for this moment. Mm -hmm. And perhaps greater grace now than we have known in recent years and months. Esther chapter 4 verse 1. I'm going to be very lazy tonight and take my time. Um, I'm not going to rush <laughs> to get to the end of what I have because I don't think it can fit in the few moments we have. Esther 4 and 1. And uh, I need to make sure that uh, you can follow me here in the scriptures. Now, I have not started from chapter 3 because that will be even longer. I've started from when Mordecai learned all that had happened. And what he had learned was a, a deadly ploy, a deadly uh, ploy to destroy the Jews. To wipe out the people of God. It was hatched. It was being hatched by the enemies of God. Um, Israel again is under one of those scenarios where they are under occupation. And uh, there is a ploy by a man called Haman to wipe out the Jews. Every one of them. This was going to be a mass extinction. What do we call it? In this modern language, genocide. a genocide. <laughs> That's the word I'm trying to find. It was going to be a huge genocide. And the news comes to Mordecai. The news comes to Mordecai. Now we are at times when news is breaking of great slaughters, perhaps not by an occupying force, but um, a ravaging virus. Our hearts turn right now to uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where there is a, a fresh concerns. I was looking at Worldometer, which is a, an important uh, website to, to go to and to see what's happening with the, with the pandemic. And the graphs are virtually vertical. The, the, the um, infection rates are virtually vertical. Uh, today, uh, we, had the sad, we woke up to the sad story of uh, one of our old friends in Uganda who was um, um, a good friend, particularly of my wife, and uh, she has been uh, fighting for her mom's life. Uh, she was taken in into hospitalization, and her daughter as well, I mean, our friend's sister, and her sister's son, three generations in the same family, have been fighting this illness, and... Uh, the good news is, is uh, our friend was sent home, but sadly her mother and, and her son passed away today, two hours apart. My goodness, uh, the, the news is, is just completely born shaking, born shattering. And uh, it, it would seem, uh, from what we are hearing from uh, that nation of Uganda, that the, the, perhaps the pandemic has peaked and may be showing signs of falling. It rose up very vertically. Thank God the shutdown happened, but there are difficulties with that because with the lockdown comes the, the deadly uh, problem of, of, star, of hunger and the lack of means. And so... Uh, I'm actually going to ask my wife to be in, in touch with, with uh, Pastor Michael even as I speak because uh, I was interrupted. Because we're trying to connect with him 
and, and, and do what we did last year to raise some money and send it down to be of help to starving families. Uh, people who are in hospital scenarios or needing hospital and have no penny to pay, pay the doctors. And so we thank God for what is happening in the United Kingdom. We are still on course for the 19th of uh, July to open up fully. And thank God for what the vaccination campaign has done here. Uh, although cases have been rising exponentially, hospitalizations and deaths are not following suit. So something beautiful is emerging here. It's not the same for these African countries where vaccination is a lottery, where it's slow and sabotaged, and in many cases, what should be free is actually being charged for. So news is on the move. And news has always been a spark point. News, the breaking of news. And I want you to remember in all those stories that I've told you, uh, when Moses arises, um, it's, it starts with, with him beginning to understand that uh, uh, the children of Israel are actually his people. And he thought he was Egyptian. And then he comes to breaking news. Breaking news, headline news. Moses, actually, you were drawn from a river. You are not Egyptian. Your blood is Jewish. And the people in the sand pits dancing to the beat of slavery are actually your, 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 your people. The breaking of news has a capacity to mobilize a response that can write incredible, powerful Bible history. Uh, the issue is what do we do with news? How do we handle news? How do we respond to news? It was news uh, that um, uh, turned Noah into a deliverer. It was news that turned Elijah into the most powerful uh, prophet, perhaps, of the Old Covenant. When he began to hear, prophet so-and-so has been killed, prophet so-and-so has been killed, the news kept breaking. Death was on the march across the landscape of Israel. And news comes to Elijah. The point is that he responded, and his response is what shapes the story of the ministry of Elijah. Breaking news, my friend, is the spark point. How we respond to news. And I don't know how you are responding, but God would have us respond. And so, Mordecai learned of a plot to destroy the Jews. And what did he do? Let's go back to chapter 4 and verse 1. Mordecai learned of all that had happened and he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. <laughs> I want you to follow what he did. Number one, he tore his clothes. Mm -hmm. now, please understand that um, in our world, we may have several changes of clothes in, in this world uh, these guys would not have had a whole wardrobe full, especially under the occupation and the, um, the afflictions that they were going through. But this man, the tearing, the ripping of, of clothes in Middle Eastern culture is the ultimate sign of distress. He tears his clothes and then he puts on sackcloth. Now, sackcloth was made of, um, of goat hair and what it was is um, it would be shaved, the softer part would be shaved so that what's left is prickly. Mm. And it was worn inside out. If you can imagine a skin, you, when you wear a skin, you want, you want the, the, um, the, um, the soft part to be against your, your skin. Mm. 
but what they would do is turn the prickly side against their skin. And what it meant I, is I will not sleep. <laughs> it meant uh, they won't sleep. They can't walk in peace. All the time they are being pricked, 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 kept alert, kept awake, remembering that something very important is going on right now. That's what sackcloth represents. It is a cloth it was a type of cloth to put on that said something distressing has, is going on. I cannot allow myself to drift off to sleep. I cannot allow myself to go on to autopilot. I must stay awake and vigilant. And I tell you, friends, we may be enjoying the reprieve and the safety of, um, of the Western world where vaccinations have worked. But we need to make sure we do not autopilot into some kind of, um, of a, a sleepy state when the nations of the world are in distress because we are the people of God. We are the light and we are the salt of the earth. We are God's answer and God's response to whatever goes on in the earth. And so he put on um, sackcloth and what else did he do? Ashes. <laughs> now this is this is um, ashes in the in the true sense of the word. It's not time to look pretty. Now I'm not saying stop making up your face, but um, the point here is more spiritual and illustrative. But these guys would do it practically, physically, and to put on ashes again is is to display. This is not a time to look pretty. This is not a time to be to be vain. This is not a time. To be shallow. This is a time to get intense. And he went out into the midst of the city. Now, I want you to consider that if Mordecai had not responded this way, the book of Esther would not be in the scriptures. Book of Esther would not be in the scriptures. It's incredible how one person's response can spark a sequence of events. That can create a whole chapter, a whole uh, script of divine uh, heritage for us to enjoy for years. And uh, news is the trigger. <laughs> news is the trigger, my friends. And your response, our response, is always what writes the script. So Mordecai goes to the center of the city, and we'll continue. And he goes into the middle of the city. He cried out with a loud voice, I believe, a bitter cry, a loud, bitter cry. Continue. And he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate. He went as far as he could go. Dressed in sackcloth. He went as far as he could go. And let me tell you, friends, we need to go as far as we can go. In asking questions. In worship. In prayer. In interventional action. We need to go as far as we can go. And God is going to help us. Clothing sackcloth. Verse 3. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, with weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. His act, whether it was purely in isolation or whether it was a catalytic act that was then modeled across Israel, what happened is this state of uprising and uprising. I tell you, friends, it's so easy to, to miss history's great moments. So easy to miss history's great moments through lax response. Uh, may God define for each one of us what response God would have us make at this time. Speaking to one of the, my good friends, 
uh, in, in Chigali, Pastor Charles uh, Mugisha, he told me, Pastor, this is a time for prayer. Mm. He said, this is a time for prayer. This is a time for turning to God in prayer. This is a time for giving. It's a time for generosity. And he said, this is also a time for discipleship. <laughs> mm. huh? And fourthly, this is a time for witnessing. Did you hear those four powerful things? Mm. Turning to the Lord in prayer. It's a time for generosity. Because there are people in need around us. And so, it's the, the need to break a loaf of bread into and pass it to one who has nothing. And so we, we are going to be inaugurating here, and I'm just wait, we're waiting for, for something to happen on the ground uh, to just help uh, the, the, the hungry in our various countries. But I know for sure that many of you being connected to the power of Africa, we, we did that last time, last year, and, and Pastor Michael was, was telling me, my brother at Omega Healing Center, how, how a difference it made, how much a difference it made time for generosity it's also time for discipleship and I want to park a little here because um, some of you if not all of you have received from me a, a, a small teaser two, two teaser videos speaking about LCF discipleship program which we are launching in September. It is not a joke. It's not a routine. It is not a time waster. It is not something to look at and think, oh, okay, here's the church again filling my inbox. <laughs> Friends, now like never before, we need to move from churchianity to Christianity. We need to ensure we are not just doing church. We need to make sure that we are returning to the Lord and return, returning to the ways of the Lord. Now, 2020 was for me an incredible year. I still feel I'm, I'm paying the price still uh, for, for the intensity that that year put, placed upon me. In God speaking to my heart clearly, that I must move into the critical area of making disciples. Jesus did not say, go run church services. He didn't say, go run conferences, although those things can be a tool. But he said, go make disciples. This has got to be intentional. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be focused. And the making of disciples, disciples is an intense, intensive process. That, uh, as those words were spoken to the um, to the uh, to the disciples, the to twelve, they knew exactly what Jesus meant, because discipleship was the way of Israel. It was rooted in their culture, that uh, rabbis would roam the land, making disciples. They were they would pursue the creme de la creme of the community. They would pursue the brightest boys in the community to summon them. And the word was, follow me. The word was, follow me. When the rabbi commish calls you to, to, to come into the call of discipleship, the word was, follow me. And these young boys, usually uh, in their teens, would rise up and get rid of all their possessions. Their families would be behind them. They would give up all their possessions, walk away from home, never to return. And they would devote themselves to following this rabbi everywhere, to learn those scriptures, to steward the history of Israel in a particular way. Hmm? It was the calling of every member of the um, of the community to support the discipleship process because the spirit of the nation depended on the stewardship of the teachings of the scriptures generationally handed down 
from the faithful stewardship of one rabbi to a company of followers who would pay the ultimate price to follow them. And so when Jesus stands and says to Peter, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they drop everything because they understand the way of the Jews. That the call to discipleship means you must pay the highest price because you have been chosen. This was a hand-picking process. They would pick you, hand-pick you to this most sacred, sacred treasure. Let me tell you, friends, the church has been hand-picked by God. That's why we are called the chosen. We are the chosen of the nations. We are the chosen of the nations to bear the heritage of Jehovah's claim over the nations for us to steward his ways, to steward his word and his spirit, and to be a preserving influence on our nations, on our uh, cities. And I feel like never before the call is now. And so 2020, I began my journey, and some of you know that I've run for 12 months and it's come now uh, to the end. And I'm just tucking in the, the final aspects of it. Twelve months of learning, relearning what it looks like and what it feels like to make disciples. And so this is what's going to happen at LCF. We are going to go into disciple making like never before. And disciple making is not preaching sermons. It's not recruiting people for departments. Disciple making is enlisting. It starts with enlisting because that's what the, the, um, the, the, the rabbi would do. He would enlist a group of followers, hand-picked and chosen, and they would bunch up around different rabbis and they would have instruction, teaching. Hmm? They would have one-on-one, one-on-one support and input and challenge so it wasn't random. It wasn't people walking into church looking nice, taking notes and going home. No, somebody would follow up to serve, to nourish, to support, to ensure that what was word turns into, into action, turns into transformation. We are going to become a community of disciples and disciple makers. And so all the pastors at LCF, are going to rise up to a new challenge of learning to be disciple-making coaches. Every one of the pastors within our tribes, as we call them, not tribes, but family teams, family teams are not just, just going to be duty, duty pockets for Sunday morning. They are going to be opportunities for people to bond heart to heart as they already are, serve the Lord, as they do on Sunday. But most important, steward, steward the uh, timeless truths of God's word and form nucleuses of growth where your pastors in the group, your family leaders in the group, myself, would be interested to engage with your journey and I want to thank God for the testimonies that are emerging out of the discipleship program that we have, that we are now concluding, of lives transformed, people touched by God, people experiencing more answered prayer, people experiencing deliverances, people experiencing healing. I am so excited that after, for me, what has been a journey of about five to seven years since I began to bang on this uh, door and, and think, Lord, how do we make disciples? And we're still learning. We shall learn together more. But I'm going to challenge everyone under the sound of my voice. Please, please, when we finally open the door for registration, do not sit back. Do not think, oh, it's something I opt in or out. Please do not look at opting in or out. Find a way to get in, whatever the cost. And we are going to find ways to ensure that everybody gets on board because that's the goal. We want 100% sign up. We want everybody to get involved. And so Pastor Pamela, 
Pastor Grace, Pastor Rosemary, Pastor Bernard, Pastor Christoph, Pastor Tony, Pastor Betty, mm -hmm. Pastor Derek. I don't know whether Pastor Fiona is ready. <laughs> she could disciple um, uh, the baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but everyone can do this. I just remember that I was pastoring a church while raising Marvin <laughs> because my wife had to work and because I was the, the, the self-employed, here I would be counseling and here I would be giving him a bottle. <laughs> so who knows what God will do. But we need to arise, my friends. Like Mordecai, we must arise. Churchianity is not going to do during these pandemic days. Uh, this crazy virus is changing courts every few months. It's throwing that one on and putting the other on. Uh, they're throwing that one off and putting the other on. We don't know what else lies around the corner, away from COVID, away from the pandemic. It's clear that we have plunged into what Jesus says called the beginning of sorrows through the Apostle Paul. He says that. This will just be the beginning of our sorrows. There are possible political difficulties. Um, possible challenges breaking out into our community like never before. Uh, when you look at how much hacking is now going on, how much computer fraud is going on, people looking for your money, people seeking to destroy what you are doing. When you see the threat of, um, of war, uh, you know, huge, huge issues of war. The church cannot fail in these days to rise up and be salt and light. Mm? Because, yes, difficult times are ahead. Some of them will, 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 will see deliverance. Others will be extended, as we've seen two years ago. I mean, wow, gap went down. The store, they're coming off the streets. You walk uh, the streets and, and look at shops we've always enjoyed shutting down. Flying. <laughs> uh, everything has changed. My God, may we cry out loudly and bitterly in our days. He went as far as the king's gate. So friends, we must do something exceptional and different. So, we are going discipleship. Pray, turn to the Lord and pray. Be generous as much as you can within the context of a restricted scenario. We need to make disciples. Thirdly, we need to bring the witness of Christ to people. And so, we are going to be finding creative ways to present the good news to a, 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 a paralyzed, frightened world. Perhaps there are new ways now that we can engage and hold discussions, have discussions that can lead to many people turning to the Lord. Okay, let us press on. Uh, I want us to move to uh, verse 4. Uh, when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai. Verse 4, Marvin. You found that? When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, Mordecai's uprising becomes a ripple effect in which news is moved and passed on. This is Esther chapter 4, and we now verse 4. So news goes to, to, to Esther. Now Esther is enjoying a royal palace. And this is what the point I'm saying. It's so easy to conveniently sit back and watch the news because I've been double jabbed. And COVID is on retreat here and we are opening up. So Esther is in the relative comfort of the palace because she's a wife to the king. Where the plot is being hatched, she is a wife to the king. And so she's protected in there and she has eunuchs and female attendants. And they came and told her about Mordecai, and she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him because he has torn his clothes and is virtually walking around in loincloth 
which was like which is like underwear and she says sent him clothes and he would not accept them he refused to be comforted superficially friends we should not be superficially comforted we must seek deeper answers for me this is the time for me to press even harder concerning 100% answered prayer this is the time for us to push even deeper for revival this is the time to trim our lamps use the excuse of the distress of the nations to heighten our claim and our pursuit of the things that we've always wanted we will not accept shallow answers the vaccine thank you so much for the vaccine but what about the one who can't find vaccination what about the one who are being charged for it friends can we use the distress of the moment to push in the presence of God and, and, and lay hold of things we could have not laid hold of in a better climate? Hallelujah, hallelujah. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Verse 5, then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, and assigned to attend, assigned to, attend to her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. <laughs> when somebody is so committed to your destruction that they are putting money down. This was the situation. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which he had published in Susa, to show to Esther and to explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence, to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hatak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death. <laughs> this guy was such a recluse. He was so drunk on himself and his own inner chamber. God knows whether he had a Nintendo in there or what is it, what, what is it, guy, guy's stuff in his cave. He was so devoted to his own personal inner chamber that he said, unless he invites you, if you invite yourself, whoever you are, you are to be put to death. Sometimes it seems like the thing we want, the very deliverance we have, we need, we have no access to. That the only sure thing is death and demise. We need the king's audience, but the king has a death law guarding the entrance into his chamber. My God. Let me finish this. So, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their life. So you are dead. And unless you are exempted specially by an act of his grace, extending his scepter to spare your life. But 30 days have passed since I've called, since I was called to go to the king. 30 days have passed. This is the wife and the wives of the king. 30 days have passed. You have been irrelevant. I do not need you. I do not need you is the message here. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, <laughs> she's basically saying, I can't do this. What you're asking me to do, I just can't do. I am irrelevant. I am unsuited. I am not gifted enough. I am not anointed enough. I am not positioned well enough. I cannot bring any deliverance for Israel. You know, in this time, it is so easy to point to our inadequacies. He point to our past frustrations, point to how life has treated us, point to how things have been wrong, point to how empty we are. But when these words go back to Mordecai, 
Verse 13, he sent back this answer. Do not think <laughs> that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Just because you have the relative comfort of being the king's wife and being inside the royal courts, you, you are looking at death as an option. For us, it is no option. We are going to die. Oh, you're going to die. And for you, it's an option, and you are taking that choice. You're going to preserve your life. But I said, do not think you will be preserved, because you yourself are a Jew. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And then he makes the, the point which matters. And who knows? that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows whether before the tragedy was hatched, before the plot was incubated, that God had actually moved you and put you in a position to be a deliverance for those that would be trapped outside the palace. Who knows? Whether you being here and still having a job where everybody has lost theirs and you have been vaccinated where others can't and you are in the relative ease of, uh, of a country where there is a health service for free. My God, can we thank God for the health, health service, the NHS. Could it be that God... For the end times, has orchestrated a spreading and a scattering of people. So that those who become hated or disadvantaged in these end times can draw from the relief that is sent by those that are their blood, that are exported behind the enemy lines. Call them enemy lines. Could it be? That the globalization that we have seen in all these past years was to just set us up for something God wants to do around the world, but using us as Esthers. Could it be that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And that's the subject of my words today, for such a time as this. As I'm saying this, I'm asking your heart to to consider that God has delivered us for such a time as this. God has given you uh, uh, protection for such a time as this. God has provided for you and preserved your job for such a time as this. God has been teaching you to pray for such a time as this. God has placed you in Liberty Christian Fellowship for such a time as this. God is springing up um, a discipleship school at LCF for such a time as this. And we will not be silent. We will not take for granted that God has hidden us. Who knows that you've come to the royal position for such a time as this. Now verse 15, and I want to close. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. <laughs> Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night and day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. <laughs> Even though it is against the law. <laughs> even though it's against the law. Even though it's unprecedented. Even though no one can do it. Even though results are not guaranteed. Let us come into agreement. Let us stop pulling in different directions. Let us stop picking holes in the thing we are doing. Let us devote ourselves to God in a singular way. He says, let us fast. 
Let everybody do the same thing. <laughs> hmm? And I want to ch challenge you, friends. Now is the time for us to do the same thing together. Now is the time not to say, oh, for me, I would rather, or I prefer, let's forget our preferences in this season. Let us pull together and sing from the same hymn sheet. Let us gaze at the face of the Lord together. Let us devote ourselves. The act of fasting was radical. You, you guys know what fasting is like. And I'm not saying here that um, uh, what, this is what we're going to do exactly, that we're going to fast. Because, you know, that, that sometimes can be so shallow in itself. But I want you to hear me. That, that I see here the need for the whole nation to wake up and understand what has happened and what's going on. And the opportunities and the threats that face the world and the, and, 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 and the people we care for. So let us do this one thing together. Then I will get up. When I see your, your unity, when I see your oneness, when you all stand together with me, because I'm going to be the front end of this arrow, I'm the one going to hit the obstacle. Hmm? She doesn't even say fast and pray. She just say fast. <laughs> Because fasting is itself a prayer. It's the turning away from the greatest force. After breathing, the next greatest force for living people is food. Breathing. After you, you know you can breathe in and out. The next thing is where is food? I need to eat. It says put that away. Put away pleasure. Put away self-preservation. Put away that. Let us focus on this one thing. I will go to the king. I will enter the courts. If I perish, I perish. There are some things you come to. And the price tag no longer matters. There are some things worth going for with all your might. Friends, imagine 100% answered prayer. <laughs> imagine preservation in the face of a pandemic. Do you know there's no hiding place, strictly speaking, in this generation? Do you know that it's all the grace of God right now? We do not know how our governments are going to process all the borrowing that they have done for us. We do not know what things are going to look like. We do not know what... Satan is incubating using all kinds of evil people. We do not know how the biology of the virus we are contending with is plotting the next move. We do not know. There is unknown. There's a lot of unknowns around us. We cannot wait for the next bulletin to break. No, we must come before the Lord with a new passion. A new drive. Friends, I created uh, two videos and I sent them to you. Now, some of you are not receiving my communication because I don't know whether you blocked me or... <laughs> I sometimes look at my WhatsApp. I'm trying to find a way to reach you on, 